G'day everyone, and welcome back to my study. You may have visited here once before if you saw my clothesline video from a month or two ago. This is the second part of that renovation, and it's to do with these 50-year-old doors. Don't mind the mess. They come out a really, really long way. They are fairly huge doors. So I can't even get this door all the way open because of the couch. So the trick is to put sliders in. I'm going to DIY it because I priced up getting it done professionally and it was prohibitive, shall we say. What I'm going to be using is some track from the good old Bunnings big box store. This one here is by Caldroy. Uh, it'll take 25 kilos per door and my doors are going to be Holocore MDF. Painted just plain white, very simple, and we'll attach some trim. All right, let's kick off the build and then show you how to install these as well at the end of it, hopefully without too many hiccups. All right, first stop is off to the local timber yard to pick myself up the MDF sheets and some pine to make the frame out of. Bit of car park cutting never goes astray so I can fit everything in the back of the wagon. And while I won't show me cutting down the sheets back at home, this is pretty much how it would have happened. So we're all unloaded and here is what I need for the doors and the trim. Most importantly, the first thing I've done, apart from transferring the measurements from SketchUp onto a piece of paper so I can read them easily, is get all of my wood and mark out what every piece is for. This beast is gonna get a workout today. First project where I'm really gonna to get to put the Midasaur through its paces and already I'm absolutely in love with this machine. It is a really good investment and a great addition to the workshop. I can absolutely smash through these cross cuts, which while I could have done previously, would have taken me three or four times as long at least. You can square up multiple pieces all at the same time, use stop locks to get everything exactly the same length, and the results were fantastic. Because I don't want to have any external screws showing, I have decided to pocket hole everything with the K5 Craig jig. Fairly standard procedure for the first part, All the holes just went into the rails. Now, one of my biggest challenges for this project was these doors are 2.3 meters tall and I don't have a bench big enough to hold them. So I had to set up everything on the floor and this is how I like to do my Craig jigging with the double clamps in that situation. To give the frame some strength and stability, we're cutting some miters, actually use a miter saw for miters. I forget where I got this little trick of pushing up your wood hard against the blade, then raising the blade and coming back down to nip off a bit. Might have been Pask makes. But it works really well to fit things in. Now you can use the Craig Jig to do miters. As long as you do a nice test piece like I've got here, ensure everything's working properly, and this little stop block on the K5 helps too to get some repeatable positioning of the holes. It will pull it tight, just like it will with a standard joint. They look a little bit funny, but these are all gonna be sandwiched in between two sheets of MDF, so no one's ever gonna see them. Same procedure, just as you would. Clamp them in smack in the screws and you get a nice tight joint even with the angled wood constantly checking for square a la pallet punter not quite as addictive as him but i do like my set square off camera i cut a middle brace again with some funky little miters in there and the joinery came out so lovely it's going to be a shame to cover it up in a few minutes quick wobble test to make sure I had adequate strength. I'll get even more when the sheets go on. A few minutes later, and there were two. Now I had to remove the lower rail because I needed to cut a relief slide groove for the floor runner. There it is. Going to go halfway through those boards. So we pulled out the router table and in several passes, just with a six mil router bit, quarter inch for you Americans, I was able to hog out the middle of it. So these doors basically hang from the top. That little plastic insert is the only guide that's gonna be keeping them on track down the bottom. 
Now I went with 6mm MDF for this. Here I am just marking out where all my wood supports are going to be so I know where to put pressure on for the clamps. It did make it kind of heavy and maybe you could get away with three, but I picked up the three at the yard and it just seemed to have too much flex in it. So six mil it is, even with the extra weight. Very, very stressful glue up here. I don't have enough clamps to do this properly and I wish I had a few more, but don't we all? Paint tins and bricks weighed it down in the middle. And a few hours later I could come by. I had many glue ups to do. I did these over a series of days actually to get everything done. Also a bit of a pain gluing it up this way because I had to scratch off all of the excess to make sure the back panels are gonna fit on well. Now because I was being a tight ass, I actually got away with three sheets of six mil MDF. If I bought a fourth one, I wouldn't have had to use two separate pieces on the back. I could have just glued them up exactly like I did the front but it's the back of the door. No one's ever gonna see that slight join. And I mean, I could do this in two sections. Let's see that again. That was bloody lucky. No harm done. There was a bit of water underneath one of my non-slip floor tiles that sent me flying back on track and in case anyone wanted to destroy these doors in 30 or 40 years time brand all the things I left a little love note in one of my stickers just to say how they were made and when they were made the pipe clamps are going to cinch together my two panels I said again you could avoid this step just by not being tight and buying a full sheet of tin before it in one way it did make the glue up a bit easier just meant I had more glue ups now I've been needing a bloody saw horse for ages and I've never made one until today. I really, really needed it for this next stage to get the doors up off the floor. So some bed slats and a few minutes later, we had that solution sorted. Here we have the complete sandwiched doors with two sheets of MDF over the frames. My first thought was to use the flush trim bit on the router and then the planer to go down the edges followed by the sander. And that worked to get rid of all the glue and flush everything up. But I then realized on the second door I'd been a dill because I could use a circular saw and a straight edge to get the same effect much, much, much bloody faster. Now, because I didn't have clamps, I had a few places where there were some gaps, but doing a bit of magic with some glue and the orbital sander, bang, all gone, no more gap. Love it. Cleaning up the little ridge line between the two joined panels on the back of the door. Dodgy hand tool usage warning. That saw cost me about $2 10 years ago. This nice new little one I got off Dave Stanton's channel. Oh, I love this little Japanese flush trim saw. It is 10 times sharper than the big one. And made some quick work of this additional mortise. Now, what these are for is on the routed edge, I hadn't gone into the styles. So I had to kit out one of them, but only one. Here on the second door, you'll see me going to the other side. So this is basically to hide that little groove from the casual observer, but also by leaving the wood on one end of it, it's gonna add as a stop, and you'll see why that's important towards the end of the project. Look, I really am very, very bad at hand tools, but this actually worked kind of well. Sandpaper on a stick, clean up what the chisel couldn't quite do, and that groove is lovely. Power tools and beer, not a great combination. Power tools and painting, especially when you've just done a favor for your neighbor and he drops off the beer for free, a bonus. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with the three or four days of painting that this was. I wanted to use my spray gun, but of course it happened to be bloody raining the whole time and I wasn't gonna use the spray gun inside. So brush and roller it was. Two coats of undercoat sealer and I think I ended up doing four coats of white on the front and two coats of white on the back to get these looking schmick. What is it with these bloody little flies that gets them so attracted to fresh white paint? Get off you little bastard. Eh, eh, oh, at least he's not stuck. Suicidal flies. Now came the stressful part. I had to get two 20 kilo 900 by 2300 millimeter doors up two flights of stairs and around a few narrow corners. So I padded off the ends, crossed my fingers, 
and hoiked it all the way up. Carefully. Very, very carefully. Now the hardest part of the whole build, getting this through this. Just did it like two seconds ago and I've already forgotten how I did it. This is the second door. I'm meant to be good at physics. Hey! Don't take out the light! Oh, that's dead set the hardest part of the whole job. I hope. I'm going to reuse this hardware on the sliding doors, but everything else has got to go. Looks like Drew Fisher installed these for me and even managed to paint over the damn slotted screws as well. What do you know, that actually worked. Yeah. One down. Seven in to go. Be gone, demon screws. Now, removing those left me with an ugly mortise problem. So, while I didn't film it, I quickly went downstairs, got some plywood, glued it together, cut off some very, very thin strips, and then with my makeshift bench hook upstairs, and again, this little flush saw that I'm absolutely loving, I cut down to size some packers just to glue them in and fill the ugly voids. One side I could clamp them, the other side I had to actually put a few nails in because there was no clamping surface. Now, a problem probably unique to my situation is this piece of wood at the top of the shelves. It was actually going into the door jam, which was gonna stop my sliders from being able to go in deep enough. I used a circular saw and then the little Ryobi jigsaw and again my new favorite little handsaw in order to knock that off. There were actually some brads which I hadn't noticed in there and fortunately the new Diablo blades went straight through them. Couldn't see any damage on the blade either so I got really lucky there. I just punched the damn nails all the way into the fiber board so that they wouldn't cause any more problems. A quick sand and by then the glue had dried on the mortise covers. I DIY'd a Diablo sanding net onto my little mouse sander. Brought those back, took out the dust from that sander, mixed it with some wood glue, just white PVA, and made my own bog, because I'm not really supposed to be going out to the hardware store right now, in current climate. Filled it in, made them look a bit pretty, sanded it back, and we can come back and put some paint on. I ended up repainting the entire frame around the door there, just cut it back and then a few coats, undercoat and the trim paint, same colour as the doors. Now to finally install the rail, it was aluminium so I could just pop downstairs to the miter saw and taking it very slowly, use my regular wood chopping blade to get through it. I took the same amount off each end in order to preserve the balance of the screw holes. And just because I don't trust anyone or anything, I added my own extra screw holes in between the ones that were supplied to give some extra strength. It says it can take 25 kilos per door, but my doors were 20 kilos each, so as I was approaching that maximum weight, better to be safe than sorry. And it only took a few seconds to whack a few extra screws in. Now, I will say, make sure you measure really carefully when installing these rails. Give yourself enough room in order to have the door mechanism going freely. I had to adjust mine a little bit. Then we could screw the wheels onto the top of the doors. Luckily, these are all adjustable, both in height and position after you put them on there, so you get a bit of play. Alrighty, first attempt at hanging. I'm not sure if I've got enough clearance in the back, and I'm really hoping nothing falls down on my feet. Let's try it. And as you can see, that was a bit of a pain to try and hang them. Got there in the end. Hey! We've got a bloody door! Holy moly! Though this is the one that worries me a bit. You have to tilt these to get them on 
and the way they recommend it is to undo three of the screws a little bit at two turns to give you some play in the track when you hang the second 20 kilo door. I'm hoping this doesn't tear it out of the ceiling, but it's what the instructions say. Let's find out. Surprisingly easy. They're touching slightly, but honestly, I don't really care too much. The width of my jam was going to be fairly tight as to the gap in between these doors, and the number of times they're opened over the years, I'm just hoping that the paint is strong enough to take it. Otherwise, I'll just have to touch the paint up every so often. Ideally, you'd have a larger gap in here, but that's just a new big mistake that I've made. And I'm just gonna have to get the trim around it, and we're pretty much done here. Right, positioning these is actually quite tough. I wanna to sink them down under the carpet. So I've marked out where they need to go. And then I've taken the Stanley knife, and I've cut a flap on three sides. Got rid of the underlay here, just to give it a bit of space. So, it's going to end up looking like that, and with that little flap, I was able to mark out where I'm going to drill the holes, sadly in the concrete as usual for me, always bloody concrete, and I'll drill those down and have some light anchors to hold that in place. Shame no one's ever going to see those again, being under the doors, but geez, they looked really neat. Installing the hardware, I thought about getting the fancy jig, but it was only two handles, so I could just do that by eye, measured it up very carefully, and got them to fit in the end. One final reinstallation of the doors, and there was a lot of fussing around here, to be honest. And we're looking good. Very happy. Nice and smooth. And here's where that little dead end on my bottom groove comes in. You can see there's always going to be a five centimeter gap between the handle and the door when they're fully closed. Off camera, cut myself up a top piece of trim, which I learned it's called a pelmet up there to hide that top rail. I put a decorative chamfer on the top and I cut out a rebate down the bottom because my front door actually sits a bit proud of that frame due to its width. A brad nailer would be very nice. Hint, hint, wifey, birthday coming up. Yep, yep, Makita, battery powered. That'd be great, thanks. However, for now, we were back to the hammer and the punch. And of course, I managed to cut the pelmet too short and actually needed to put some chocks in either side, but a few bit of paints and some bog, and that hides all sins. Well, there we go, all done. And this room has never really been cleaner since we had to get all the sawdust out of here from a lot of sanding and hacking around. I'm really happy with how these turned out, though they're far from perfect. I have saved hundreds, if not thousands of dollars by doing this myself. Maybe one day I'll come back and do the insides as well as, you know, these shelves here are not exactly the most practical layout for a modern wardrobe, but having the sliding doors has just been such a good thing and improvement for this room. If you enjoyed the video, I would encourage you to please give it a like, and if you would like to see more content for do-it-yourself and woodworking stuff, tune in to Fix It Fingers by subscribing to the channel, and I'll catch you on the next week's build. See you then. Cheers.